Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much to Nathan and Petar for inviting me here. I was so happy this ended up being able to still occur after being planned pre-pandemic. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Okay, so I have a lot to get through, so I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, the paper is titled Transcendental Appropriation, Kant and Heidegger Schema and Transition, and opens with this epigraph from Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics. In respect before the law which as a free creature I give to myself, I cannot despise myself. Uh, also, these slides, mostly just to give you something to look at while I go through a lot of really dense textual stuff. Um, some of the things I won't be able to get into, they're just sort of side material that may be of interest. And some, just some of the, the block quotes I'm using, it's easier to follow if we're talking about Heidegger and Kant. Heidegger's thinking is often characterized by himself most of all as being cloven by a transition. It was a transition that began in the immediate aftermath of being in time, in a moment where, as he said in March of 1932, all of his prior output had become alien to him. He had been on, he thought, a path brought to an impasse on whose edges stands much that is contemporary and mendacious, often in such a way that these are taken as more important than the path itself. In other words, he considered his thinking up to that point to be guided by disidentification, oriented always away from that which he would correct in the history of philosophy and the scientism of modernity. Being in time was a massive success, but it was also, he thought at that time, readily misinterpreted and misused as an anthropology or a philosophy of existence. He even worried that he had spoken as the learned they without realizing it. Everything up to that point seemed to him to be a failure best put in the shadows of what would come after. So he set out on a new course, away from an, the existential analytic of being and toward a conception of being as event, from the understanding of being to the happening of being. This also brought him away from the thought of conditions and toward the thought of the capacity of those con conditions to change, to be radically and irrevocably transformed. Where and when did this alienation from himself begin? Chronologically last among the works Heidegger listed as belonging to his pre-transition thinking was Kant and the problem of metaphysics. An exegesis of the Critique of Pure Reason published in 1929. The Kant book, as I'll refer to it, was thus for Heidegger the dead end of the sequence with which he continues to be most associated, the development of the existential uh, analytic, or rather uh, up to the publication of Being in Time or rather the publication of the first two divisions of the first part of Being in Time. In Heidegger's plan, part one would have been followed by a second part comprised of a further two divisions, and at the heart of one such of, the, of these would have been the analysis of the Kant book, which tracked the profound transformation that the faculty of imagination underwent between the first and second editions of the critique. For the most part, the critique's substance remained unchanged across the revision and Kant made no major changes to his system. This wasn't the case, however, for the section in which he worked out his argument for the objective validity of the categories. The transcendental deduction will be a little overlap with the previous talk, sorry. Uh, the Kant book's goal was to recenter the schematizing power of the imagination in that argument and also in uh, Kant's thinking as a whole. For Heidegger, the schematism is not as it is conventionally understood to be, or maybe I should say canonically, and dominantly understood to be the post-empirical application of rules for the synthesis of products of the understanding and the intuition, but is instead a pre-empirical capacity for synthesis more generally that stands at the root of both uh, faculties as the soil in which all else grows. So we've, this is kind of interesting to follow up uh, Samantha's talk and, and to give an idea of one of the more um, most cited articulations of this conventional reading of the two deductions would be like Dieter Henrik, the proof structure of Kant's transcendental deduction, where he goes through the history of both of them. This is like a 1969 paper. And his argument is essentially that, I think it's similar to Samantha's, that it's a, it's a, there's no like difference except for a semantic sloppiness in uh, the use of the word mine is what he focuses on in this reading. In Daniel Dahlstrom's characterization, Heidegger had noticed in Kant's doctrine of schematism a connection between the traditional problem of being and the phenomenon of time. 
He, acu he accused Kant of retreating from the question that he had left open prior to the revision of the critique and claimed that his own thought was posing that question anew. Most of all, he felt that a reconstruction of the first version of the deduction uh, suppressed up to that point, and he was reacting uh, against the neo-Kantianism of his time. Uh, he was at, at Marburg when he was working on those seminars, and that was the prevailing mood there. Could articulate a concept of temporality that didn't require a subject, which was also his goal. In carrying out this reconstruction, though, Heidegger found something he may not have been looking for. The question of the capacity for transition between the ontic and the ontological. This notion that what is ontically true for Dasein, its inauthentic determinateness, could in some sense become ontologically true for it, as an authentic freedom for determination, was absent prior to this point. At the outset of the Kant book, he still holds that ontic truth necessarily adjusts itself to the ontological. By the time of the contributions to philosophy, a decade later, post-transition, as he would position it, uh, one of the differences is that the ontic-ontological distinction had all but disappeared from his discourse. It's not something he uses as much. There, the ontological, I'm um, gonna try and do this when I'm quoting him, other people, even when grasped as a con condition of the ontic is only something supplementary to it. If between these two points, Heidegger began to identify Kant's transcendental imagination with his own conception of temporality, and any problems he found in the former would, by transitive relation, become visible in the latter. And indeed, they did. My suggestion in this paper is that this identification with Kant uh, made his own transition both possible and necessary for him, his trajectory away from being in time irrevocable. Just as the transcendental imag imagination in Kant became for Heidegger a legal activity that forms even as it unites, turning caprice into rule, Ontological truth became the event of the ontic's possibility for ontological adjustment and supplementation, turning thrownness into origin. This is to go a bit too far in advance. First, I'm gonna try and show the importance of the deduction to the critique. Uh, I'm gonna lay out the two versions of the imagination given by these different editions, the A and B deductions. And once this has been accomplished, I'll try to show how exactly Heidegger performs his retrieval of the priority of the imagination in A, and how he pro problematizes the supposed solutions offered by the B. I'll track the impact of this retrieval on both Heidegger's turn and the legacy in his work of the Kantian concept of schema as it transforms from a dangerous precipice of indetermination into the ground of post-turn Dasein's peculiar form of auto-affection via the insistence in Stagdekite on identity. It is this form of autoaffection that I claim is at the root of one of the two dominant understandings of transition today, transition as appropriations. That's kind of where this fits into my research. <clears throat> at the heart of the critique of pure reason is the question of those conditions which make experience and thus knowledge possible against empiricists who held that knowledge is constituted by experience alone and denied the possibility of preexistent truths, Kant attempted to show that our experience is indeed conditioned by a priori concepts. These are the concepts of the understanding which structure any possible judgment, namely quantity, quality, modality, and relation and their moments or modes. These concepts in turn find their content in the faculty of the intuition, which structures any possible sensation both temporally and spatially. In the transcendental aesthetic which precedes the deduction, Kant shows how space and time are necessary representations, forms of representation of objects rather than objects in themselves. Without these forms of representation, there could be neither sensation nor knowledge. Space, the form of pure magnitude, is what allows for things to be outer objects for us. And time, the form of pure succession, is what makes the experience of perdurance and all actuality of appearances possible. These two structures of possible representation aren't equal, um, even in the B deduction, however. Since, for time, since time for Kant is nothing other than the form of inner sense, to which an outside can be related via its determination, time is also the condition of space. The intuition is what any category of the understanding must stand in essential relation to. Categories, too, are nothing other than the conditions of thinking in a possible experience, 
just as space and time contain the conditions of the intuition for the very same thing. However, the possibility, indeed the necessity of these categories rests on the relation that the entire sensibility and with it all possible appearances have to the original apperception, in which everything is necessarily in agreement with the conditions of the thoroughgoing unity of self-consciousness under universal functions of synthesis. These functions of synthesis reside in a faculty of the imagination, which bridges the intu intuition and the understanding. The first thing that must be given to us a priori for the cognition of all objects is the manifold of pure intuition. The synthesis of this manifold by means of the imagination is the second thing, but this still doesn't yield cognition. The concepts that give this pure synthesis unity and that consist solely in the representation of this necessary synthetic unity are the third thing necessary for, co for cognition of an object that comes before us. It is Kant's second thing that changes drastically between the first and second editions. In the first edition, the order of thought proceeds as follows. Kant begins by returning to, to the conjecture that there are a priori concepts and forms of representation at all. If they do exist, he says, they can certainly contain nothing empirical. To have them refer to determinate content at the outset would defeat the purpose of the pre-experiential truths that he sought. What these concepts contain are only ever the pure a priori conditions of a possible experience and of an object of it. A priori concepts like the categories are thus the pure thinking in every experience, but not the sources of experience. Intuition cannot be said to be the source of experience either, since every intuition contains a manifold in itself, which would not be represented as such if the mind did not distinguish the time and the succession of impressions on one another. What could give us the truth prior to experience of something like manifoldness, insensibility? That which intuition gives its representations, again, pure succession in time, magnitude in space, <clears throat> is not yet experience as such, so much as a way that experience must be given if we're to experience things the way we seem to. What the intuition actually does give us is not even initially grasped as manifold. Its multiplicity is so chaotic that it can't even be thought as multiple, let alone thought at all, uh, at least initially and in itself. Something else is doing the giving here, and it's the imagination, which, and this is really important, spontaneously allows the manifold of intuition to be gone through, taken up, and combined in a certain way. This tripartite movement, a synoptic going through, a reproductive taking up, and a recognition through combination, is said, said by Kant to be the threefold synthesis, which is necessarily found in all cognition. In both versions of the deduction, synthesis in the most general sense concerns the action of putting different representations together with each other and comprehending their manifoldness in one cognition. But the A deduction uniquely gives the imagination essential tasks in each of these three moments. First, synopsis, which apprehends the manifold as manifold. Second, reproduction which takes up the manifold as a totality, even when its full membership can never be given. And third, recognition, which combines the manifold with concepts according to rules uh, known as schemas and allows the manifold to be taken as a unity. A couple examples <clears throat> of this. I think Samantha remarked that one of the examples of uh, schema is number or mathematical figuration and Kant talks a lot about geometry. This is just one example of something like this. It was a part of 17th century geometry. Bonavent Bonaventura Cavalieri's principle of volume for two figures. Uh, there's a reading of this use of schema in Kant that describes this as being really concerned with figuration and the grammar of figuration. Sibyl Kramer has an interesting article on this. Um, so if what I'm, I'm still summarizing is of your board, feel free to look at this. In the imagination's first moment, apprehension, the imagination must run through and then take together a manifold, the manifoldness of a given intuition. Synopsis doesn't mean summary or condensation for Kant. Its meaning for him is closer to its etymological roots, a coming into view or a seeing together. Synoptic synthesis is not an apprehension of a whole. This occurs later. 
but is more akin to a, I mean, logically later, sorry, it's more akin to an unstructured but ongoing riffling through. This first form of imaginative synthesis were not by definition always incomplete. It couldn't encounter a manifold at all since what it would have before it would only appear as an unchanging whole of like you've finished going through uh, the entire Rolodex. Unlike in the B deduction, the imagination is already defined by a temporal dimension in this way of describing it, of the ongoingness of it as a procedure, as well as by a unity that's logically prior to uh, any apperceptive eye, which hasn't come into the picture yet. Uh, when turning to the second of the three moments of the imagination's synthesis, Kant remarks that representations that have often followed or accompanied one another are finally associated with one another, thereby placed in connection in accordance with which, even without the presence of an object, one of these representations brings about a transition of the mind to the other in accordance with a constant rule, another form of schema. There seems to be, Kant is saying, a law instituted by the imagination upon the multiplicity of any manifold it riffles through. As soon as the first moment of apprehension slash synopsis is in play, as soon as the manifold is taken as manifold, its elements can be grasped in their temporal succession and relative magnitude. At the same time, the relations of succession and magnitude reproduce the manifold's manifoldness in every member of it. Um, that, that belongs to it, um, even as a potential relation. Kant explains this through his uh, famous example of cinnabar. This is really kind of cheap, but it's just a pretty stone. So you just yeah, and it's all, it always forms uh, with mer with mercury deposits too, which is not often remarked about this example. That um, in its natural state, it's uh, poisonous also. So I'm sure we all know this quote, but I'll just reread the last little part about it. If cinnabar were now red, now black, now light, now heavy, if a human being were now changed into this animal shape, now into that one, if on the longest day the land were covered with fruits, now with ice and snow, then my empirical imagination would never even get the opportunity to think of heavy cinnabar on the occasion of the representation of the color red or if a certain word were attributed now to this thing, now to that, or if one and the same thing were sometimes called this, sometimes that, without the governance of a certain rule to which appearances are already subjected in themselves, then no empirical synthesis of reproduction could take place. <clears throat> this is the A deduction's first divergence from the B, first major divergence. Without the second moment, Kant says, not even the purest and most fundamental representations of space and time could ever arise. The reproductive imagination in the A deduction is a necessary condition, not just for our representation and experience of objects, but for the forms of our intuition they put into synthetic relation. And since manifolds of appearances are not things in themselves, but the mere play of representations, which in the end come down to determination of the inner sense, it's left open whether reproductive synthesis may not determine the inner sense uh, as well to some extent. And by that I mean left open a deduction. As a result in the third moment, the synthesis of recognition, when the identification of objects comes about through the combination of intuition with conceptual judgment according to rules of their various schema, the a deduction is forced to conclude that the imagination grounds transcendental apperception and not the other way around or at least that these components of cognition stand on equal footing. Transcendental apperception is a pure, original, unchanging consciousness, even in this uh, version, but it's also nothing more than the identity of its action. What is its action prior to any other? Nothing more, Kant says at this point, than the threefold synthesis he's laid out for us, or of its combination. In the A, the apperception of the inner sense also ends up being something intuited as manifold and thus synthesized by the imagination. It also possesses a unity which endures in time and encompasses an extension, as with the concept of a body which serves as the rule or schema for our cognition of outer appearances. And like cinnabar, its unity and perdurance would be lacking without a rule like this. Cinnabar, after all, really is at once red, black, light, and heavy, among many other things. But the mind doesn't take each of these appearances of the stone in turn. It takes them and must take them as a unity. 
Kant acknowledged where this path could lead. <clears throat> the principle of the necessary unity of the pure synthesis of the imagination prior to apperception is thus the ground of the possibility for all cognition. This is a kind of quote that makes me like disagree with this argument that it's purely a semantical difference. Uh, we can talk about that in the conversation. But it seems Kant should be forced to say that transcendental synthesis, which he calls productive synthesis, is more pure, original, and unchanging than any apperceptive eye. If this were the case, if a pure synthesis in the imagination did stand equally alongside, if not logically prior to pure understanding, then it would still remain in itself entirely undetermined and contingent whether appearances were also associable. And in case they were not, a multitude of perceptions or even an entire new sensibility would be possible, in which much empir empirical consciousness would be encountered in any mind, but separated and without belonging to one consciousness of myself, uh, which he says is, is impossible. So he kind of wants to disagree with the, the conclusion he seems to have let himself into. <clears throat> the only remedy Kant could offer for the circularity A introduced was at the end the suggestion of an affinity uh, between the apperceptive eye and the productive synthesis of the imagination, an indelible resemblance of one to the other, an identity between them. So if a new affinity could be produced, uh, the eye would, by implication, see itself transformed irrevocably without a trace of what it had once appeared to be. So we'll return to these questions soon. In the B deduction, the order gets reversed. Rather than beginning with the question of the possibility of a priori concepts, Kant begins where the A left off, with the question of the ground for synthesis as such. And transcendental apperception is his new answer to that question. In B, Kant holds against A that through the I as simple representation, simple, he's changed his mind concretely on this point, nothing manifold is given. The transcendental apperception of the B deduction is a simple, i.e. not composite, representation, an instance of objective unity, in contrast to the manifold determination of inner sense, which is now merely a subjective unity uh, rooted a posteriori in empirical self-reflection on consciousness as manifold. In a sense, Kant decided to shunt the argument that had led him to aporia at the end of A out of the pre-experiential altogether. It's not that he's saying that characterizing apperception as productive synthesis should or could be denied, but that it can only be accessed as such once the eye has been determined empirically in some way. And the determination would have to come from experience and not from the pure possibility of synthesis. His example uh, goes along with this shunting, for it's now the self that stands in the place that Cinnabar had stood. Apperception, he says, must have both an objective and subjective unity because otherwise I would have as multicolored, diverse a self as I have representations of which I am conscious. What was once a counterfactual against the flux of experience is now a counterfactual against the flux of that which experiences foreclosing the potential of productive synthesis to create identity beyond the subject. <clears throat> the imagination, too, has been downgraded in importance. In B, it's no longer a faculty of cognition in its own right, but an effect of the understanding on sensibility. Its discussion, he says, belongs not in transcendental philosophy, but in psychology. And its three moments are replaced with just two, intellectual and figurative synthesis. In B, these modes of the imagination are but sub-faculties of the understanding in that they require for their activity concepts that only the understanding can render, and both remain transcendental only insofar as the understanding is treated transcendentally. But whether given as an intellectual synthesis, which is the combination of a category with an intuition in general, or a figurative one, it's kind of related to the diagrammatic question, and his examples are mathematical in that section, the combination of sensible intuitions onto a manifold to which the eye could be added. The imagination is only the faculty for representing an object without its presence and in intuition. This is kind of the reduced, weaker form of it. This was formerly the job only of the reproductive synthesis in B. So that one's kind of been split in two and expanded to be the whole domain of the imagination. The first absent object furnished by the figur figurative synthesis just as had been the case with um, the second moment in the A deduction, 
is the apperceptive eye itself. But in B, this representation is in the very same motion handed over to the intellectual synthesis, which adds it to all other possible re representations, where formerly both possible objects and the possible being of the apperceptive eye implied thinking's tardiness to the scene of the imagination. Now, <clears throat> now the being of apperception and its imaginative activity is given only in its actual synthesis with its objects, and that's the extent of its objective unity. In the standard interpretation, the B deduction was a clarification through concision of A. In Kant's view, B resolved A's circularity, the grounding of the subject in a productive synthesis that guarantees its own unity. This is that circular problem. Not by denying such a ground, uh, this is what he would say, but by stating that it too is unknowable to us. By inverting the order of reasoning and clarifying that the site of subjectivity isn't produced by the imagination, but produces through it a relation to its exterior, Kant thought he'd answered his critics and found a stable footing for his system. In Heidegger's view, though, Kant's revision was a retreat. In the con concessions that B made, Heidegger saw a limited and merely epistemological argument about the finitude of the subject and its grasp on truth. In opposition to this epistemological interpretation, Heidegger says at the outset of the comp book that the critique of pure reason has nothing to do with the theory of knowledge. If one could allow the inter interpretation uh, that it does, then that would be to say that it's not a theory of knowledge. Um, it's not a theory of ontic knowledge, but a theory of ontological knowledge. In his 1929 debate with uh, the neo-Kantian philosopher Ernst Cassirer, Heidegger stated his sense of this project plainly. I believe I'm able to show the problem of appearance in the transcendental logic for which Kant is only negative in the form in which it appears, which for Kant is only negative in the form in which it appears there. Uh, that it's actually a positive problem and that the following is in question. Is appearance just a matter of fact which we state or must the entire problem of reason be apprehended in such a way that we grasp from the beginning how appearance necessarily belongs to the nature of human beings? So I'm just gonna move to the comp book now. <clears throat> what is immediately clear is that in the three modes of the imagination's synthetic activity, they've been translated into a Heideggerian idiom in the comp book. The synthesis of apprehension, which it, with its synth synopsizing going through, becomes an immediate taking in stride. The synthesis of reproduction, with its taking up of what is no longer immediately given, is a retaining forming. The synthesis of recognition, which combines the manifold with concepts, is a reconnoitering, which explores the horizon of being able to hold something before us. It's a preliminary attaching, a watching out for, and a preparation for pure identification, not with a being, that, a being which it can hold before itself as self-same, but with the horizon of what that being can identify and identify with. Each synthetic moment is read for its temporal character and made to stand in for the present, past, and future. For Heidegger, the transcendental power of the imagination is original time. It's thanks to this temporality, this forming of time through time determination, that imagination is said to be productive. The imagination's productivity is never accomplished, though, even as it makes experience possible for the first time, as a perpetually incomplete engagement with what can potentially be encountered or conditioned in all the way that Kant's thinking develops. But the imagination's creativity is what is said to be essential and that it temporalizes, finitizes the subject and its possibilities. For Heidegger, all determination of essence is first achieved in the setting free of this essential ground of possibility. And if we tarry alongside the A deductions abyss and refuse to read the imagination as a mere effect of the understanding, Heidegger wagers, then we can catch sight of what is being set free by the perpetually homeless, groundless, forming unity of both. In order to clarify this point, we have to explore the central element of his interpretation, his approach to the tripartite uh, relation between appearance, schema, and image. At the core of Heidegger's Kant is the claim that appearances are not mere illusion, but the being itself. Far from the idea that appearances are substitutes for or deformations of things in themselves, or Kant's own warning that their relation to the noumenal is unknowable, Heidegger is content to accept them as things in themselves. They are appearances of themselves only. Appearances for Heidegger can only mean the standing forth of the appearance as a being. 
The being in the appearance is the same being as the being in itself, he says. In turn, the pure understanding reveals itself as the faculty of letting stand against. Appearances stand forth, occur, and concepts stand against those appearances. In characterizing the phenomenality of objects as ways of standing and withstanding, Heidegger again is emphasizing their temporal imminence in that they withstand and endure time and appear to have a permanence only because of this. It's because this substantiality of appearances is also related to the work of the imagination. In addition to that which we intuit and that which we understand, he says, there has to be a third thing which stands in homogeneity with the category and the appearance and makes possible the application of uh, the former to the latter. This mediating representation has to be pure and yet intellectual, sensible as well. Such a representation is the transcendental schema. What schemas represent, no matter their object, is a transcendental time determination, a modification of the inner sense by its synthesis with a sensible manifold. Schemas do not concern themselves with any intuition in particular, though. They're merely the guarantors of unity in a, de in a determination. When applied a posteriori and supplied with empirical content, the imagination produces not a schema, but an image. <clears throat> the image, Kant says, is a product of the empirical faculty of productive uh, imagination, while the schema of sensible concepts, such as figures in space, this mathematical legacy, is a product and, as it were, a monogram, signature, of pure a priori imagination. It's here that Heidegger asks, if ontological knowledge is schema forming, then therewith it creates forms from out of itself, the pure look, uh, and this is his riff on image. Is it not the case then that even ontological knowledge which occurs in the transcendental power of the imagination is creative? Does not the finite creature become infinite through this creative behavior? Do beings come to be known then in this creative ontological knowledge, i.e. are they created as such, created as known? Sorry, these, this is him, sorry, remember. <clears throat> Absolutely not, but to what uh, are they related? What is the known of this knowing? A nothing. Kant calls it the X. And I'm going to claim that two points are being made here. I'm trying to summarize these dense passages. Um, first, by interpreting Kant's transcendental object equals X as uh, the reference to a nothing, Heidegger is insisting again that the transcendental deduction can function without any reference to a ground beyond appearance, which I think is the real essence of this disagreement between uh, which, deduct, which version should have priority. Second, in his interpretation of image as pure look, uh, he's claiming that what schematism produces isn't experience, but a field in which submission to a rule becomes possible. Because transcendental time determination accompanies all intuition as a condition of its possibility, for him, the pure power of imagination gives schema forming in advance the look, the image, of the horizon of transcendence. The schema forming is this, this field in which uh, that becomes possible. As a result, time procures a look prior to all experience which serves as the ground for our being there. A schema is the representing of the rule that guarantees the manifold's perdurance and the making sensible of rules. Well, an image is the possibility of actually sensing that rule before it comes into view. Images are capable of changing, which is always this novel uh, yet original coming into view for Heidegger. <clears throat> uh, but schemata are not capable of changing. Against Kant, Heidegger claims that the understanding does not bring forth the schemata, but just works with them, as if they pre-exist our perception. In a sense, he claims, pure thinking in itself, not after the fact, is capable of taking things in stride, i.e., Pure thinking is pure intuition. This structural, coherent, receptive spontaneity must accordingly spring forth from the transcendental imagination uh, to be able to be what it is. And that's kind of his summary of the, the thesis. In fact, transcendental apperception is all but superfluous to Heidegger's Kant, because for him, the power of imagination is also and precisely a faculty of intuition, i.e. of receptivity. And it's receptive, moreover, not just apart from its spontaneity. Rather, it is the original unity of receptivity and spontaneity. 
and not a unity which was composite um, from the start. The self-affection that Heidegger claims Kant shrank back from is equally a self-intuiting, a sponta spontaneity of attention to the possibility of schematizing, which arises only through the recognition of one's essence as auto-legislating. It's as if one must encounter oneself as having, like we give ourselves the rule of our own identity um, at every moment. <clears throat> um, let me just skip this one a bit. So the general, generalized capacity for identity that Heidegger locates via this reading is not an identification with something that the imagination is not. It doesn't prefer possibilities for a change of identity as a product, project that can be taken up. Its identification is an essential structural belonging together of appearance and being, and of the possible with the actual. This is what he means when he describes the imagination's a priori synthesis as the seed which provides its own ground. Um, to Heidegger, the imagination is this root and ground at once. And no matter the course of its development, it has to remain germinal in that sense. So what of Kant's theory of change? How does Heidegger incorporate this into his own? In short, for Kant, change is real, knowable only in the phenomenal realm. Anticipating the accusation of idealism, he specifically names the problem of change in relation to time. He doesn't deny the reality of alterations, but says that it's cognition that orders representations in such a way that change and that which is capable of change becomes visible. For Kant, time isn't a thing in itself that subsists on its own, but a sequencing of nows that can determine the inner sense as continuous. Without this continuity, transcendental apperception couldn't function as an unchanging ground and the infinite range of possible representations of what lies beyond it would remain disorganized and multiple. The eye wouldn't even be able to distinguish itself from its representations, as has, he mentioned earlier. But the eye is, at the same time, nothing more than its combination with its representing. This is why he says that there's only one experience in which all perceptions are represented as in thoroughgoing and law-like connection. Whether the schema in question is a mathematical figure or a body, empirical change in, in appearance cannot touch uh, or alter the a priori condition of imagining change. Transcendental uh, apperception, if you're cleaving to the B deduction, uh, or the imagination, if you're taking the A. So yes, alterations are real, but the condition by which they become thinkable uh, as alterations can't be modified let alone from out of its own spontaneous thinking. For Heidegger, it seems the answer about change must be different. In his interpretation, Kant's system never needed to find a ground in our perception, because its true identity was the imagination's temporalization of itself. If appearances are said to be taken as things in themselves that refer, that refer only to a nothing, then any change in appearance would constitute an ontological change. One might assume that an identification of time, thought, and intuition um, means that schematism is in some sense a free activity, a poetic power of gathering essential to the subject slash Dasein. This wasn't yet the case, uh, though he would get there. What Heidegger saw in the Kant he'd created for himself was first simply that auto-affection is a kind of radical passivity. One of the examples he gives uh, is pleasure. I'm going to skip over this quote, but something Jean-Luc Nancy has talked about about the self-sensing of pleasure. The free self-affecting of the law that in the absence of ground um, is given, and the way that the given modifies itself is always the law, the schematization of its own being. This is for Heidegger the truth of Kant's pure spontaneity. There is in every experience, sensible or no, a self-submitting, immediate surrender to pure receptivity. There must then be only one experience for Heidegger as well, submission to the given, and recognition of the given's role in the authorization of everything that submits to it. Heidegger's interpretation of the schematism in the comp book stands between his definition of Dasein and being in time, a throne projection of its own possibilities, and what Dasein would become post-turn, post-transition in the contributions, a throne projection that is only when it refuses what is possible for it when it embraces as most proper to it the seclusion from potentiality. 
And being in time Dasein's projectedness is denied any uh, relationship to the teleological, to the execution of a plan. There, projecting has nothing to do with comporting oneself toward a plan that's been thought out and in accordance with which Dasein arranges its being. This begins to change in the Kant book, where we're told that the explicit execution uh, of a projecting, and even what is grasped in the ontological, must necessarily be construction. This construction can be understood as Dasein's assault upon the primal metaphysical factum in it, an assault which arises from Dasein itself. And Dasein bears a new identity altogether uh, after the transition and contributions. Uh, is this first, I won't read this first, uh, all of this first quote, just the italicized line, the projector of the projection is a thrown projector, but only in the throwing and through it. It's the carrying out and taking over of the withstanding steadfastness. It's Dasein and taking over is the undergoing, wherein what is self-secluding opens itself as a maintaining and buying. Uh, binding. It's very abstract, but in the event, another part of this sequence of uh, seminars and notes from the same time period summarizes, sheltering is the enshrouding that preserves emergence, the most proper essence of the beginning. It's indestructible act of beginning. Uh. <clears throat> Behind the density of this passage, Dasein is transformed. And in possession of a capacity to finally decide upon a possibility most proper to it, which is always the sheltering of possibility from actualization. For Heidegger, this allows Dasein to bind the ontic potential of its thrown projection as the ontological truth of originariness. Appropriation transforms beings into being. This preparation for transition, if not is, if not the transition itself, which would be the event of being's occurrence for the, the Heidegger of the contributions, it's the closest that the beings that we are uh, get to change this preparation. Heidegger calls this a nearness to the event. It goes without saying that the view of transition uh, as appropriation that I'm trying to attribute to Heidegger here is at once supremely radical and conservative. It is, uh, I think, sort of a, putting this into layman's terms would be to say that the greatest possible change is to refuse change, to become who one already is or finds oneself to be. This definition of transition encapsulates the best and worst of Heidegger's legacy, philosophically and politically. Prior to the turn, Dasein was nothing but its possibilities. After, Dasein's possibilities are its origin. And thus origin, even an origin yet to come, is, only, is its only possibility. In this sense, the Dasein of the contributions is something overcome in the event. Something that, in every instance, has decided finally that its possibilities are its truths. Whereas being in time's Dasein decides only uh, on which are its own. To make what is true possible, that is what the thoughtful projection of being has to accomplish. Accomplish? To be sure, but not as a fabricating or devising in the sense of an unrestrained contriving. For this to occur, a moment of that which is appropriated by being as appropriating event, a moment of Dasein has to be successful. So the goal-driven decision has appeared after this uh, transformation. It was the productive, auto-effective passivity Heidegger discovered in his reading of Kant's schematism that finally allowed him to think that a decision against radical change could be the most profound transitional event. As Charles Shurover puts it, it's a short step from Heidegger's Kant to Heidegger himself. In the Kant book, Heidegger claimed to be adding to Kant's three guiding questions. What can I know? What should I do? What may I hope? A fourth. What is the human being? In his view, Kant saw that the person is more than the I. He saw that the person is grounded in self-law giving. This is just the full quote from which this comes. This kind of gives you an idea of the political moment also. Uh, <clears throat> but he was not able to see, Heidegger said, Kant wasn't, that he had no path to the essence of space and time. For Heidegger, this path could only be the becoming law of the human being. This transition does not take the form of a remaking, but is rather the appropriation of what is as what could be, the transformation of the actual into the possible, sheltering it from its possibility. It's ironic that Heidegger's identification with Kant in his transitional moment triggered such a profound transformation in him. 
He was a philosopher who he, had felt, he felt had retreated from the essential question. And it's this figuration, transition as a retreat from transition, that Heidegger ends up applying to his own theory uh, of the event, using as his theory of the event. His own flight from the tasks he'd set for himself prior to the Kant book can then only be seen as a kind of honesty, I think, in his commitment to his particular kind of change, a flight from a retreat. Kant fled from the power of the schematizing force he had located in the imagination. Did Heidegger shrink back too? Okay, thank you. Sorry for going over it.